the Senate, so I think members might be uh, tending to their vote. Senator Paul, I understand, was here. He just left in order to cast that vote, and then he'll be coming back. And when he arrives, we'll allow him to give his opening statement. Uh, at, at this point, I want to just welcome our two witnesses and thank you all for joining us today for this important hearing on how the federal government can empower women entrepreneurs and unleash the potential of women-owned small businesses so that they, they can continue to be a growth engine for our economy as we recover from COVID-19 pandemic. This hearing comes as we close National Women's Small Business Month during which we recognize the contributions of women entrepreneurs to our local and national economies. I look forward to National Women's Small Business Month each year because women entrepreneurs should be celebrated for prospering in spirit of the historical barriers to success that persist. National Women's Small Business Month, particularly important in my home state of Maryland, as it boasts the highest concentration of women-owned small businesses in the country. We're very proud of that, many of which are owned by minority women. It is a distinction that fills me with great pride and informs my work as chair of this committee. Today's hearing also falls two days after the 33rd anniversary of the Women's Business Ownership Act being signed into law. This landmark bill eliminated state laws that prevented women from securing a business loan without a male co-signer, and it established the Women's Business Center program at the Small Business Administration. We are now far removed from these antiquated state laws, but the past 18 months of COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated that women entrepreneurs still face many structural barriers when they start, operate, and attempt to grow small businesses. Throughout the pandemic, women entrepreneurs have been more likely to report a significant decline in the health of their business than their male counterparts, according to the research conducted by the Kaufman Foundation. And historically, women-owned small businesses lag behind male-owned small businesses in four key indicators of future business growth, investment plans, revenue projections, staffing expectations, and access to capital. While the pandemic has shined a light on the structural barriers women still face, it has also demonstrated that the federal government can play a key role in breaking down those barriers and empowering women entrepreneurs. A recent report issued by the Government Accounting Accountability Office found that the policies championed by Senate Democrats in the Paycheck Protection Program and Health Care Enhancement Act, Economic Aid Act, and the American Rescue Plan made later rounds of the Paycheck Protection Program more equitable and accessible for underserved communities. While small business owners received only 9% of the initial PPP loans authorized by the CARES Act, the report found that the share of loans made to women-owned business, small businesses following changes made by Congress increased that to 16%. This is in line with the percentage of small businesses owned by women which is also 16%. This report is proof that through thoughtful, concerted efforts, it is possible to bridge the historical gaps that prevent underserved entrepreneurs from starting and growing small businesses. I was proud to work with my colleagues in the Senate, including several in this committee, to secure those improvements to the PPP, and I'm looking to build upon that work in the months and years ahead. Now, as Congress continues to negotiate President Biden's Build Back Better agenda, a once-in-a-generation investment in our families, communities, and small businesses, it is vital that we build on the lessons learned during the pandemic to continue investing in women entrepreneurs. That is why I'm looking forward to hearing the testimony of Tamira Lucas, founder of the Cube Cowork in Baltimore and co-founder of Moms as Entrepreneurs, Dr. Lucas will shed light on the unique barriers that women, including mothers, face on the path to business ownership. I would also like to congratulate Dr. Lucas on the Cube Co-Works grand opening of its expansion last week, making it the largest black-owned co-working space in the country. Congratulations. I'm looking forward to hearing from women impacting public policy president and CEO Candace Waterman, who advocates on behalf of women business owners uh, to Congress. I know that that organization is celebrating its 20th anniversary next month. So Candace, I want to thank you and your colleagues for your tireless efforts 
to empower women small business owners over the last two decades. I hope to hear from you both about the tools and resources Congress can create and improve to support women on their entrepreneurship journey and ensure their success. The COVID-19 pandemic interrupted a period of tremendous growth for women-owned businesses. Women-owned businesses employ 9.2 million people, 8% of the total private sector workforce, and they generate $1.8 trillion in annual revenues, 4.3% of the annual private sector revenues. While these numbers seem small on the surface, they tell a remarkable story about the potential for women-owned small businesses from 2007 to 2018. Total employment by women-owned businesses rose 21%, while employment for all businesses declined by 0.8%. In, the in other words, for the past decade, women-owned small businesses have been the drivers of economic growth in our economy despite the myriad headwinds they face in the path to success. This fact is even more evident when it comes to minority women. Between 2007 and 2018, businesses owned by minority women grew by more than 163%. Imagine what our women entrepreneurs could do if there were less obstacles in their way and if they had more support during their entrepreneurship journey. Supporting small businesses through the COVID-19 pandemic has been the most challenging and most important thing this committee has ever done. Our efforts to build back better in the years ahead will be another incredible challenge, but they also are our opportunity to help our economy grow in a fairer, more productive way. We simply cannot waste the time that we have to make the progress in these areas. We must commit ourselves to using this opportunity to create thoughtful policies that will empower women entrepreneurs for generations to come. And with that, let me yield to the ranking Republican member, Senator Paul. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The chairman makes a great point that women are doing very well and uh, in small business across America and I think in every way have shown themselves to be the equal of men, if not uh, often the superior to men. But it's also, I think, inadvertently an argument for why we don't need special set-asides, you know, for, for women. I think they can compete on their own two feet just with men. You know, when I took over as ranking member of this committee, I believe that our charge would be to create an environment in which all small businesses can flourish. Instead, our work here, though, is focused almost exclusively on which side of the scale the heavy hand of government should place its thumb. While some businesses may have just been too large to qualify as small businesses and were ineligible for the Paycheck Protection Plan, the Biden administration has continued to violate the law to pay back with taxpayer dollars their political ally, Planned Parenthood. Then came the Restaurant Revitalization Fund, whose race and gender preferences were struck down by the Sixth Circuit for violating the 14th Amendment's guarantee of equal protection under the law. It's simply galling that after Democrat governors shut restaurants down, shut the economy down, that Congress would insist that before owners receive assistance, they are first asked whether they are a man or a woman, black or white, Pakistani or Iraqi, and that the answers to these questions determine whether you go to the front of the line or the back of the line. Which brings us to today's attempts by the Biden administration to favor one set of races and genders over others. Rather, we should embrace the words written by Justice John Marshall Harlan in his dissenting opinion in Plessy versus Ferguson. He said, our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among its citizens. The free enterprise system is consistent with those words. Free enterprise empowers those who innovate, who take risks, who work hard, including women. In other words, free enterprise is the great equalizer. The facts demonstrate that women entrepreneurs do not need government handouts. While just shy of 60% of Small Business Administration's microloans go to women-owned or women-led businesses, a majority of women entrepreneurs use private loans and sources of funding to start their own businesses, compared to just 20% who use SBA loans. Moreover, women-owned businesses have a nearly 70% success rate with crowdfunding, outstripping male-owned businesses by nearly 10%. The history of women in business is a great one. Private tech companies led by women achieve a 35% higher return on investment than similar companies led by men. Look around. Women are succeeding like never before. Whether it be in academics or business, 
Women have proven themselves to be the equals of men. Frankly, it is insulting to think that women need affirmative action. A century of economic history demonstrates beyond a doubt that the best way to promote economic growth and upward mobility for all is to adhere to free market principles. Those are the policies that should be on the agenda today, but they're not. If the Biden administration and most of my Democrat colleagues in the Senate were truly interested in discussing the issues facing female entrepreneurs today, we would be here to discuss the impact of rising inflation, growing supply chain crisis, inflation throughout the system, all these effects and all they're having on American small businesses. Instead, Democrats are planning to exacerbate these issues by spending trillions, trillions more of American dollars, money that we don't have, in their attempt to remake America. At a time when 86% of small businesses today say they're concerned about inflation, and 74% say inflation hurt their businesses, the Congress is now, led by the Democrats, doubling down on failed big government socialist policies in precisely the wrong prescription, making it harder on small business. Rather, we ought to rediscover old economic truths, that all entrepreneurs thrive when they're encouraged to innovate and compete in a marketplace. This committee should work to end discriminatory and patronizing programs and instead focus on policies which all small business owners, no matter their race or gender, are most likely to thrive. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Senator Paul. We'll first hear from Dr. Tamara Lucas, who is a mompreneur, a mother and entrepreneur. She is CEO of the Cube Cowork, a co-working space in Baltimore that also provides childcare services, and co-founder of Moms as Entrepreneurs, an organization that focuses on decreasing chronic poverty by helping mothers build sustainable businesses. As of 2019, Dr. Lucas' program, Moms as Entrepreneurs, has helped over 100 moms launch businesses in Baltimore and she recently expanded the Cube Co workspace to increase opportunity for even more entrepreneurs with children. Dr. Lucas, pleasure to have you here. Good afternoon, Chairman Cardin, Ranking Member Paul, and members of the committee. Thank you for having me today. I'm Dr. Tamara Lucas, CEO of the Cube Co work, Baltimore business leader and business professor. As a mom, wife, and entrepreneur, I struggled to choose my business or my family. I quickly learned that I was not the only mother faced with these struggles after training hundreds of mom entrepreneurs locally and nationally through my organization, Moms as Entrepreneurs. I spent two years researching solutions to, to these problems that many women entrepreneurs battle. The results of my extensive research determined that mom entrepreneurs all shared the same wants, more time, a network, and support services to grow their business. I created a solution to address these barriers to success for women entrepreneurs, the Cube Cowork. The Cube Cowork is the largest black woman-owned co-working space in the United States to provide a space where parents no longer have to choose their businesses over their families. The Cube Cowork provides on-site babysitting services, business building resources, a network, and office space rental. The vast majority of growing businesses in the United States are women, and more specifically, black women. Unfortunately, this same demographic experiences multiple pandemics, including the lack of financial capital, human capital, race inequities, and social capital to break the ceiling of 40 million to increase impact hiring. During the pandemic, women entrepreneurs, especially black women entrepreneurs, were the most resilient, yet received the least support. With the lack of capital that already exists pre-pandemic, women entrepreneurs had to figure out a way to survive during and after the pandemic. What we saw in communities like Baltimore was women using their creativity, social platforms, and the power of working together to ensure their business sustain. In theory, this sounds profound, but in reality, this shouldn't be the case. We saw women business owners being pushed out of financial bailout opportunities like the first round of the PPP loans and IDLE, where big corporations who had the resources benefited and small women-owned businesses continued to struggle. 
This should not be the case. This catastrophe taught us that women entrepreneurs need more access to capital and resources that women, women business centers provide. The Women's Business Center should continue to be funded and supported to help bridge the gap of support services needed to sustain a business. For example, many women-owned businesses could not access resources like the PPP loans in the beginning because they did not have proper accounting systems, bank with large financial institutions, or had a payroll. Women-owned businesses tend to, tend to not be in the place to have the resources to set up proper systems or hire full-time or part-time staff. 61% of black women entrepreneurs start businesses in retail, beauty, health, education, or social service sectors. They're typically small and formal businesses with low margins in crowded competitive markets and are more challenging to sustain over the long term. This is due to the lack of knowledge, financial resources, and family consideration. However, these businesses are, are keeping the lights on and food in the refrigerators of families. These businesses are the ones that are setting a foundation to close the wealth gap in black communities. According to the Kaufman Foundation, 37% of moms don't start businesses because of family considerations like childcare access. For those who do start their businesses, nearly half of them don't believe their businesses will succeed, which is why black women have fewer established business owners compared to their high rate of new venture startups. Access to key resources needed for entrepreneurship is unevenly distributed in U.S. society, reinforcing the advantage of certain groups while impeding the entry of catching up of disadvantaged groups. Black mothers are often pushed into necessity entrepreneurship, which often generates low income and they have fewer choices in how they engage economically. Mothers who choose entrepreneurship as an attractive economic opportunity with access to the right resources are better able to start businesses and grow it. Mom entrepreneurs ideally sit, are ideally situated in close proximity to their potential cu customers and collaborators in the city, they're often over, in the center of their often overlooked communities despite these added pressures. They are in an ideal position to identify business voice that address community needs and provide opportunities to generate income and wealth. The social economic reality for black mothers and women entrepreneurs in Baltimore and, sim and similar cities are defined by the legacies of structural racism, including redlining and underfunded education, in addition to the wage gap women face. The actual reality is that our economy would not sustain if it weren't for women entrepreneurs and women consumers. I have seven recommendations. Number one, continue to fund and expand women business centers in underserved communities and cities. Number two, accelerate finalizing the funding opportunity for the SBA Community Navigator and ensure the organizations that receive funding to implement these services have the capabilities to reach the underserved demographics. Too often, funding opportunities are given to organizations that do not have the capabilities to reach the actual people that need the services. Under the Office of Women's, Women Business Ownership, create an advisory board that solely focuses on addressing the issue mom entrepreneurs face, such as family considerations. Mom entrepreneurs continue to be grouped under women entrepreneurs, and there's a huge difference between being an entrepreneur as a woman and being an entrepreneur as a mom. Number four, create an advisory board that will help the SBA interface look less daunting to everyday women entrepreneurs and provide relatable outreach services. Most entrepreneurs do not access resources offered by the SBA because the interface is not friendly to those that need it most. We have to design access to services that are, that are equi equ equitable to all, for all. Number five, Access to capital should be made easy for women entrepreneurs to access, taking into consideration that more than half of the 11.6 million entrepreneurs are moms living below the poverty level and may not have a great credit rating or collateral. This should not be the defining factor in whether they should ex access capital to, to start or sustain their businesses and create general, generational wealth for their families. Number six, provide affordable childcare to women starting and growing businesses. Often these resources are given to women who are looking to go into the workforce, but not women who are creating the workforce. 
And number seven, provide access to affordable health care. Women entrepreneurs' hesitation to start businesses often includes the barriers to affordable health care as an entrepreneur. Because of the lack of affordable health care for entrepreneurs, women tend to work full-time jobs to obtain health care while working in their business full-time. Women should not have to balance both or choose. In closing, in order to encourage more women to be entrepreneurs, they need to know that they have the resources and support to do so. This is, just, this is not just business resources, but this includes adequate housing, child care, education, and mentorship. Thank you for your time and opportunity to share my expertise and thoughts. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lucas, and we are very proud of your activities in our city of Baltimore. Uh, we'll now hear the uh, web from Mrs. Candace Waterman, who is the president and CEO of Women Impacting Public Policy, a national nonpartisan public policy organization advocating on behalf of women business owners and its coalition of 79 business organizations. Mrs. Waterman has over 35 years of experience spanning across the private and public sector, owning companies herself in the medical, real estate, and hospitality industries. In her current role, she works in a bipartisan way with lawmakers like ourselves to impact and influence policy that provides economic equity, procurement inclusion, and access to global marketplace to women entrepreneurs. Mrs. Waterman, pleased to hear from you. Thank you so much, and good afternoon, Chairman Cardin, Ranking Member Paul, and members of the committee. It is an honor to meet you and to be invited to speak to the committee today. My name is Candace Waterman, and I serve as the President and CEO of Women Impacting Public Policy, a national nonpartisan organization advocating on behalf of women entrepreneurs, strengthening their impact on our nation's public policy, and creating economic opportunities while forging alliances with other business organizations. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today at this hearing, which will highlight the strength of women small business owners during the COVID-19 pandemic, the ongoing barriers to success these entrepreneurs face, and how Congress and the Small Business Administration can better support small business owners and encourage more women to pursue entrepreneurial opportunities. Women Impacting Public Policy is a national nonpartisan organization which educates and advocates on behalf of women-owned businesses across the country. Since its inception in June 2001, WHOOP has reviewed, provided input, taken specific positions on many economic issues and policies which affect the bottom line of our membership. The issues cover a broad range of current legislation and or policies such as affordable health care, leveling the playing field for women-owned businesses, opening up federal procurement policies for women-owned small businesses, the implementation of well-established federal law, which seeks to encourage women in the marketplace, tax policies, energy, telecom, and more. Matters which are not directly relevant to the economic health and well-being of the constituent of businesses are not part of our agenda. Since its founding 20 years ago, WIP's policy priorities have shifted to meet the times and to address the emerging policy areas impacting the economic health of women-owned small businesses, such as digital infrastructure and workforce development. Additionally, at its core, WIP's advocacy has always been the focus on increasing parity and equity for women-owned small businesses and federal contracting and access to capital. As an organization which represents the country's over 12 million women-owned businesses, we have within our ranks Republicans, Democrats, Independents, Liberals, Conservatives, and every variety of opinion. We urge and encourage our members to become involved and politically active as their conscience dictates. Our organization surveys its membership on a regular basis to determine which priorities and policy issues for them, and we maintain the issue committees to review these options and alternatively look to them for advice on legislation that meets the needs of our membership. 
In order to further our objectives, we maintain relationships with all members of Congress, as well as the incumbent administration, regardless of political affiliation. And we intentionally maintain our bipartisan, our nonpartisan approach. WIP has tackled federal contracting issues since its inception. Access to federal markets continue to be a challenge for WOSBs given the federal government has only met its modest goal of 5% awards to WOSBs twice. One missing piece is a good data on these large multi-year contracts, also known as MACs. In addition, the government does not have sufficient data on whether subcontracting commitments have been met. A significant legislation victory was achieved in 2018, giving small firms more runway to transition out of the small business set-aside program and into the full and open competition. The law allows businesses to average revenues over five years rather than the previous three years for the purposes of determining their size standard. WIP will continue to advocate for changes to acquisition policies that will generate more contracts for women-owned small businesses. Current efforts include support for expanding sole source awards to small businesses, reinvigorating education and support for women-owned small business procurement programs in Congress and in the agencies. WIP's efforts to level the playing field cuts across a wide set of issues relating to the government's acquisition policy. Without our advocacy, small businesses and women-owned small businesses will continue to lose ground as procurements become larger and longer. Access to capital remains the top concern for our women-owned small businesses. As members of this committee are well aware, Women-owned small businesses have experienced great levels of hardship due to the pandemic and have struggled to access the capital necessary to keep their businesses afloat. Without delving too deeply into these hardships, it has widely been reported that businesses owned by women were more likely to lay off employees, report losses in revenue, or close permanently more than any other demographic. Also, in regards to financing, even when women successfully secure financing, it's often less than they originally requested and certainly far less than what is needed. In a similar vein, women apply for less funding due to what I call application anxiety. On average, they ask for $35,000 less than men. With all of that said, WIP has, is committed to making access to capital our top priority. To that end, we frequently engage leaders in Congress and in the private sector to amplify measures that would increase women's access to capital. This includes engagement with banks, fintechs, financial institutions, NGOs, and nonprofit organizations. We also host monthly advocacy updates for our members to keep them abreast of updates on the Hill, as well as provide them an opportunity to hear from policymakers like yourselves. Additionally, WIP hosts regular educational sessions for our members on access to capital. WIP was founded in 2001 with the sole intention of serving America's women-owned businesses through advocacy and education. Since our founding, we have consistently prioritized economic health, well-being of constituent businesses, and have maintained bipartisan relationships at the state, local, and federal levels. Like many organizations, WIP has been confronted with rapid changes in the small business community as it relates to federal contracting and procurement, technology, infrastructure, and economic opportunity. As these changes have occurred, WIP has made great strides to confront them head on through our greatest strengths, and that is advocacy, education, and mobilization of the WIP network. Over the years, WIP has been heavily involved with policymakers and experts in the private sector 
whether that be through participation in hearings like the one we're having today, meeting with key staff and committees through developing strong partnerships. Our actions have brought strong results on behalf of women business owners. For example, WIP fought for the implementation of the Women-Owned Small Business Procurement Program, which gives federal agencies the authority to set aside contracts for WOSBs. In 2015, WIP pressed for and achieved the swift implementation of sole source authority to the WOSB procurement program. More recently, WIP has joined Senator Carton, the Rockville Economic Development and uh, Maryland's Women's Business Center for a roundtable discussion on the issues that affect women business owners as they're running their businesses. WIP also advocates for the, the collection of meaningful data as it relates to financing and federal contracting for small businesses. An issue that has become increasingly important throughout the pandemic. It is critical that policymakers understand how aid is allocated and what can be done to better serve the demographics that are passed over for this aid. I would like to thank the committee for inviting WIP to testify today and thank you, Chairman Cardin, Ranking Member Paul and members and the staff of the committee for all of the work that you do on behalf of America's women small businesses. I look forward to answering your questions and a robust discussion. Ms. Waterman, thank you very much for your comments and your, your incredible record on advocacy on behalf of women-owned small businesses. Uh, we have been joined earlier, as I said, by Senator Paul and Senator Ernst. We also have Senator Hawley, who has joined us by WebEx, uh, Senator Hickenlooper, and Senator Rosen, also by WebEx. Uh, as I explained earlier, the members are, are, are coming in and out. If, if a member on WebEx w wishes to ask a question, if they just show their video, we will uh, call on those uh, that are on the, the WebEx. But, but let me get, uh, and I see Sen Senator Hickenlooper took me up on that suggestion. So let me call upon Senator Hickenlooper. I didn't want to usurp your role as, as asking the first question, but since you've called on me, um, first, I just want to thank uh, both our guests and appreciate uh, how much work they've done and, and as busy as they are taking time out for our, uh, for our hearing. It's important and it makes it good makes a big difference and it's important for us to get more perspective on some of the challenges we're facing. Um, Women-owned businesses obviously are are not getting their fair share. If you look at startups, the, the percentage of venture capital that goes to women-led startups is under 3%, which defies any possible uh, measure of, of what's going on. And we've, we've got a bill we put together, the Small, Biz the Small Business Investment Program uh, to try and make sure that the actual professionals who are directing and 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 expanding the access to uh, that kind of early stage funding, uh, that there are more women and more people of color uh, in that in those roles. Uh, I also uh, come from Colorado, and some of you might know um, uh, Guild Education, uh, which is one of our. Are, it's a women owned, woman started business that provides a marketplace for connecting large corporations for their for these large corporations to get their employees connected to various colleges and community colleges. Um, it's run by it was founded and and is still run by a woman named uh, Rachel Romer Carlson, um, who can tell if she was on this call she would provide a lot of context <laughs> of. Of, of, of so many of the challenges that she faced and uh, chilling, really chilling stories of, of here they had this great idea. Just so her, her business is now valued at over $3 billion. Um, and she is a, 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 one of those rare success stories. Anyway, I'd like to ask both of our witnesses today. Um, do you think, you know, I mentioned that we're, work, we're working on uh, diversifying the, the pool of asset managers do you think that will help, uh, you know, lead more capital to businesses like yours? Is that something that you think would help? And and, and what else could the SBA be doing to encourage um, or to make sure and facilitate more venture capital going to women-owned businesses? 
Why don't we start with Dr. Lucas? Could you clarify, you said, I didn't hear the first part of your question. There, there, so there are uh, serious professional restraints on who qualifies. We, you know, there's, uh, uh, the SBA has a program called the uh, Small Business Investment Program, creates uh, pools of money that are directed and usually in partnership with, with private money uh, but for, for early stage investments, for, for venture mm -hmm. capital. Uh, the people that run these funds are generally all white males mm -hmm. uh, and have been for a long time. And this seemed a, an appropriate place to, to reach out and, and, be, and propose legislation that would change that. Anyway, I was wondering if, if there are other things you're aware of that the SBA should be doing to uh, facilitate getting more funding to women-owned startups and, and startups that are not just by women, but people of color, you know, other marginalized communities, uh, what could the SBA be doing that would provide even more help? Great, great question. Um, so, of course, one of the challenges that small, like you said, small businesses have is excess, and but it's excess to patients' capital. And so if there were funds available, let's just say five, 5,000 to 15,000, like a revolving fund um, tied to technical assistance, there is a good chance that there could be more mom and women owned businesses to thrive. Mrs. Waterman, you want to uh, add anything to the answer? Yes, I would just like to add um, on top of Dr. Tamir, um, this sort of mezzanine funding, if you will, or this um, sort of bootstrap funding to, you know, make payroll or pay for certifications. I think that is really needed. And I think the other thing is we need to look at the way that we're funding because it's not a one size fits all. We need to meet the businesses where they are to ensure that the methodology is appropriate when providing funding. Got it. No, I appreciate that. And I agree completely. Um, I'm almost out of time, but just uh, quickly, uh, patents, the people that apply for patents are dominantly men. 12% uh, of investors uh, or inventors, not investors, but 12% of inventors filing for patents in 2019 uh, were women. That is painfully low. Um, most of the best innovators I know, starting with my wife, are, are women. Uh, and yet somehow we've made that process feel foreign. Um, and I guess we're running out of time. You, maybe you can, I'll, I'll follow this question. You can, you can answer it in more detail, but I would just quickly ask each of you, is there anything the SBA could be doing to facilitate the, the getting more innovators, more women into that process of filing patents? Ms. Waterman, you want to start first? Thank you. Um, I would say it, it, by and large, it's education. Some people don't even understand the process. So I think education is key at all levels to understand one, how to protect themselves, how to protect their IP, and more importantly, how to make certain that that IP is sustainable. Oh, I love that. You're right. Uh, we've, we've been joined by Senator Cantwell. I'm gonna give her a moment. Be your, or, or, Senator Cantwell. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much for your- The former loss. chair of our committee, I uh, might point out. Thank you. I, I love our partnership because even when we were uh, the chairman of the committee, you did such great work in helping us with access okay. to capital. And now that I'm over at Commerce and you're here, we're partnering again with your great help on the Minority Business Development Agency. Thank you. And hopefully we will get a record that was your legislation that was authorizing that organization. And, and I just want to underscore that point. We were able to get the uh, SBDA language included in the infrastructure, thanks to Senator Cantwell, uh, to give it permanency and expand its applications, which is a critical tool to help the underserved minority communities of small business. And Senator Cantwell, thank you so much for your, your work on that. So we're, we're very excited about that because uh, uh, one of the issues is now obviously putting more money into that. So I don't know if the witnesses, you know, we have a couple of organizations in the state of Washington that are very focused on minority women uh, business organizations and try to grow access to capital. So I don't know if the witnesses uh, want to talk about um, access to capital. This, what we like about the MBDE is similar to the gap we found at SBA. There's the programs, but where's the advisory help and support? And some of those mentoring programs, 
the most senior people in business, well, guess who they ended up being? Mm -hmm. White men. And so when it came to the products and services that win women might be offering, they weren't as expert on what those products and services might be or the interest. So anyway, I just uh, don't know if somebody wants to ca uh, comment on access to capital issues as it relates to trying to marry up, particularly for the minority community, what we need to do. I think maybe Dr. Lucas can give her personal experiences uh, that she had confronted uh, in her efforts. Absolutely. Um, so let me first say, access to capital has always been a hot topic and a huge barrier for women, especially minority women entrepreneurs. And the major problem with access to capital is that often minority women, especially those in underserved communities, do not have the credit score or the collateral to access funding. And I believe Congress could better support these entrepreneurs with early startup funding that does not have many barriers or contingencies. Let's think about the mom from West Baltimore, me, who desires to start a business and is currently working a job that ba barely pays her bills. The chances of her having a good credit or co um, collateral is very low. She should, she should not have to give up on her entrepreneurial dreams because, she, um, because of generations of poverty and structural racism that she was more likely born into. There's a huge opportunity to align access to capital to federally funded social service programs because contrary to what people think, many individuals who qualify for social services want more for themselves, but we have to design programming and opportunities to allow them to obtain more. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me follow up on, on some of these points. Um, first, Dr. Lucas, thank you for your seven-point suggestion. And both of you have mentioned the access to capital issues and the challenges with capital. I, I want to go down some of these issues and I want to get to the experiences under the Paycheck Protection Program, which I think underscores some of the structural challenges we have in underserved communities. First, in regards to women's business centers, we're very proud of our women's business centers. Thank you for that recommendation. We just opened up one recently at Morgan. Uh, and, and, and we also, by the way, opened up one in Salisbury. So we, uh, we're, we're now fortunate to have three women business centers in the state of Maryland, and they are all very valuable. Uh, in regards to the Navigator program as part of the American Rescue Plan, your suggestions there are good suggestions. You've got to make sure it's implemented in the way that, that reaches the underserved communities. The family considerations, Can't, Senator Cantwell's point was, was so well taken uh, the challenges that you have in your answer. Co-work is truly unique, and we're blessed to have you in Baltimore, but there are so many communities that don't have a co-work where they can uh, take care of their family, where, where a woman can take care of her family obligations as well as uh, enter the, the workforce and be an entrepreneur. We're trying to correct that in the Build Back Better agenda. Now, that's being negotiated as we are here today. We hope this is going to be successful within the next 24 hours, but we deal with child care, affordable child care. We deal with health care access, which are critically important if we're going to be able to get the full entrepreneur participation in our economy, as you both have pointed out so well. Uh, but let's get to capital, because capital really is, uh, I think, the driving force. Senator Hickelooper mentioned SBIC. It's uh, one of the tools available for capital, but it's a closed shop today. It is a, a narrow group of entrepreneurs who can benefit from the SBIC. And, and one of the areas that we're trying to expand that is to get fund managers that represent our community, particularly the underserved community, so that we can get startup capital and venture capital to minority small businesses and women-owned small businesses, where today the percentages, as Senator Hickenlooter pointed out, is virtually non-existent, the availability of venture capital. So, we, we need to be able to do a better jo job in all of that. So my question to you is, what do we take away from the Paycheck Protection Program? This was the largest single program ever devised to help small business. Uh, $800 billion of, of funds were made available in a relatively short period of time. Now, now here's a program where there was no risk to the bank, because it was 100% guaranteed by the government. We paid their costs. 
We did everything we could to make it easier for them to accept applications quickly in order to get money out to save small businesses. And yet we know during the first rounds of PPP, the underserved, underbanked communities, women-owned small businesses, were not represented in the numbers that represent the number of women-owned small businesses in our community. So I guess my question to you, what is the lesson learned from this? We did modify the program as we went forward, including making sure that there was allocations to mission lenders that have a much better record in underserved communities. And we did expand the idle uh, program, which is much more direct uh, SBA involvement rather than the banks. A and then lastly, we had a grant program because as you pointed out, Dr. Lucas, in some cases, small businesses can't take out loans. They're just, the, the credit's just not there. The assets aren't there. They don't want to take out additional loans. They need grants. So my question to you is, as we look at moving forward, what is the lesson learned from the PPP experience, which got off to a rocky start with women-owned small businesses, as we look at building back better access to capital, women-owned small businesses, where should we put our priority? I'll start with, with Mrs. Waterman. If you have some views on this, I would appreciate it. Absolutely, thank you. You know, we totally understand that the pandemic took its toll, right, on businesses, particularly on those women and minority firms, um, with more than 71% of, of them having a decreased um, business um, revenue. I think that PPP and IDLE did work. I think that it worked for what it was. I think as we look at the next step, if you will, and our lessons learned, we've got to understand that the funds that were provided during that time, many people took it out of desperation. And so as they are desperate to keep the doors open, de desperate to pay their employees, desperate to keep homes afloat, um, we've got to have the education for people to understand the cash flow, um, what does the, the funding that they're receiving, what does that mean? You know, it, what funding is right for them? Some of our members, um, I had a few who said, you know, they actually didn't really want to have what it is that they receive, meaning because it had the terms and conditions of it was were just too stringent for them. So I think one education is key, having us understand the true impact on the businesses that receive this funding, where are they at now? What funding do they need going forward? And are we ensuring that we're educating them on how to manage the PL so that it can be a sustainable funding, not just a right now type of funding? That's very helpful. Uh, and and uh, Dr. Lucas, your recommendations on the navigators would certainly help in that education and outreach uh, suggestions to make sure the capital gets out in a more equitable way. I'm going to yield to Senator Duckworth, who's on WebEx. Let her get, give her a chance to ask the question. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank the uh, uh, folks for being here on this very important uh, topic. Earlier this year, a joint survey of nearly 1,200 female entrepreneurs was conducted to understand how they were affected by the pandemic. And the survey findings demonstrated the resilience of women entrepreneurs and just how important they are to rebuilding our economy. For example, many of the women surveyed had started a new small business over the past year. And of these new ventures, nearly half were owned by women of color. Ms. Waterman, could you address how increasing federal investments in women entrepreneurs would deliver a strong return on investments for local economies and job growth? Absolutely. You know, I say investing in women is an investment in our future and our economy. We know that women make 85% of the decisions in the household. They influence the other 15%. And when you overlay that with a business owner being a woman and opening businesses at record rate rates prior to COVID, showing their resilience and innovation, I think those are the components, right? And the recipes for success in terms of knowing that the return on investment 
is there as you invest in women-owned small businesses or in, in women businesses in particular. They will have the funding to, again, not just start up their companies, but to grow their companies and then be able to impact our economy uh, in a, a very strong manner as we're looking to make certain that we're moving from crises to recovery. Thank you. I, I couldn't agree with you more about the importance of supporting women-owned small businesses at the federal level and the need to specifically help female entrepreneurs. Uh, it's why this summer I reintroduced my interagency committee on Women's Business Enterprise Act. I was proud that our committee chairman, along with Senators Tim Scott and Susan Collins, joined me to introduce this bipartisan bill that simply seeks to restore the federal interagency committee that was originally created to lead a whole of government effort to support and, pr and promote women entrepreneurs. Ms. Waterman, in your testimony, you mentioned the need to better understand how federal aid is reaching or failing to reach, as you just in your um, answer to the chairman just now as well, uh, how federal aid is reaching or failing to reach women small business owners, particularly women of color. Do you believe that restoring and reinvigorating the interagency committee on women's business enterprise would improve federal government's efforts to solve long-standing challenges such as making sure that federal support is actually reaching women-owned business enterprises and that we're get, sending them the most appropriate uh, uh, support that they need? I, I say a resounding yes. And I say that with in June of this year, we submitted a letter um, to Speaker Pelosi and leaders Schumer, McConnell, and McCarthy to express our support of the Interagency Committee on Women's Business um, Enterprise Act. And we know that that agency is really critical to the federal government as it develops policies that would support these women business owners, right? After the last 18 months that we've had, which has been exceedingly challenging for women businesses in particular, it is our hope here at WIP that Congress can work together in a bipartisan manner um, so that federal government can provide targeted assistance to this demographic of women entrepreneurs as they seek to start and grow their businesses. Thank you. I wanna switch gears a little bit and talk about the care economy. I've been frustrated with a recent debate that sort of tries to separate so-called real infrastructure investments like roads and bridges and, and airports from investments in other economic programs that I think are just as important um, in the care economy. I think there's a false dichotomy here that ignores the reality that the care economy investments would empower more parents to start new businesses and level the playing field for small businesses that struggle to compete with large corporations because those large corporations can afford paid leave, but the small business that's just starting out just simply can't afford it no matter how much they want to um, provide it. I think you know that's why I led 14 of my colleagues in sending a letter to Senate leadership pushing for major investments in caregiving as part of any Build Back Better package. Dr. Lucas, you highlighted mom entrepreneurs in your testimony. Could you address the caregiving challenges confronting mom entrepreneurs and address how enhancing our caregiving infrastructure from expanding affordable child care to making home and community based services accessible to our loved ones could help these entrepreneurs to start and grow their businesses? Absolutely. Thank you. So just to kind of put some context to this, the medium annual income for full-time female entrepreneurs is $40,000. The average cost of child care just in Maryland is $15,335. The average yearly rent is $16,800, and the average yearly grocery bill is $8,600 for a family of three. We are, women are expected to raise families without assistance or work unfulfilled jobs, right? So in order for you to qualify for daycare vouchers, that's just a whole different um, battle by itself. A family of three has to only have, a, has to have an income of no more than $60,000, right? And so a Maryland resident, they either have to, you know, take their spouse or their, um, the child's father down for child support. There are all of these guidelines in order um, to receive ass assistance. And so these re requirements are not realistic, nor do they support the mom who desires to start or run a business. And I think that is extremely important for us to really look at how our social service system um, is set up and how we are constantly pushing mothers into um, low income jobs. Thank you so much. I'm um, over time as the chairman, thank you. 
And let me uh, thank uh, Senator Duckworth for her leadership in regards to the interagency uh, uh, task force. Uh, your work has been incredible there uh, on behalf of women, so thank you for your, your leadership on these issues. Uh, I want to thank both of our witnesses for their testimonies today. We're going to have a chance to deal with the issue Senator Duckworth uh, was referring to in the care economy. We clearly are going to make that one of the major centers of our Build Back Better budget that we're working on right now. We are looking at strengthening the tools in the SBA toolkit to deal with the underbanked, underserved communities with women-owned small businesses. Uh, we are optimistic. We're working very closely with the Biden administration, and we are together in our priorities and with our counterparts in the House. So uh, I particularly want to thank our stakeholders who have been working with us, uh, in, including uh, the women impacting public policy. Uh, you've been a great uh, partner for us in these e efforts. And as I said earlier to Dr. Lucas, we're very proud of what you do in Baltimore, filling such an important need so that entrepreneurs, women, moms can enter uh, the entrepreneurial space and help themselves and help our community. Uh, with that, uh, the committee uh, will stand adjourned with the thanks of the committee to our witnesses.